Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Barhead Alberta Mayor Dave McKenzie. A small town with big heart, Barhead stands proudly in north central Alberta. With its roots set in agriculture, farm fresh culinary experiences aren't just a luxury in Barhead, they are the gold standard. Barhead's shop-filled streets where people say good morning and mean it, you will experience the friendly small-town way of life with many things to do. Access Alberta's natural amenities with things to do in the region such as hiking along Athabasca River, paddling in the area's many, many lakes, and visiting various campground, motorsport parks, and so much more. Barhead is a place of wellness, diversity, and compassion. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back after a quick break with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Dave McKenzie. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor Dave, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit. And I want to start with a question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Dave? I grew up in a farming community in rural Saskatchewan. And my parents were part of the uh, greatest generation. Uh, my father had served in World War II, uh, you know, and and it was be because it's a small community that I grew up in. Uh, everybody pitched in to make things happen. Uh, there wasn't a lot of resources available. The economy was uh, tight, uh, to say the least. So if if uh, people didn't pitch in and help each other. Uh, things just didn't happen. And I was a great witness to the things that I saw that community achieve because everybody um, would help push the cart, so to speak. And I think it was just sort of ingrained in my in my lifestyle because it's that that was that's what I observed in my formative years growing up. And I don't think I ever thought life uh, worked any other way than that way. Uh, the community, to be a community, has to function as a community. Uh, everybody needs to be involved and, and uh, yeah, and pitch in and help out a little bit. And in my experience moving forward in my life after I left the farm and carried on with my, in my seeking of fame and fortune, um, you know, it just, it was just part of my lifestyle. And I would have to say, uh, I reaped, in my opinion, some tremendous uh, uh, values out of it, and uh, had I've had some amazing opportunities because of that. Um, you know, when I mentor youth from time to time, and I say, you know, you could you could apply for a, a, a job sweeping the floor at Nassau, and they wouldn't have a budget for it. But if you went in there and said, I want to volunteer to do anything that you want me to do, you'd be on the next space shuttle, you know, uh, because volunteers get to do stuff. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for a job, yeah, maybe not. But you go in and volunteer. And uh, and I always said, you know, it may not improve your, your paycheck, but it'll improve your circle of acquaintances 
it'll give a lot of influential people a chance to see what you're all about. Um, and I've had a number of youth that have helped me out flipping burgers at fundraisers and stuff. And, you know, other than that experience, I probably wouldn't have gotten to know these kids, right? And you sit there and you flip burgers with them for a couple of hours, you know, at a fundraiser or whatever, and you chat with them and you hear what they are all about, what they're, um, you know, what they want to seek out in their lives and stuff like that. And then, you know, three months later, they give you a call and say, would you mind being a character reference for me? And I go, yeah, absolutely. And coming from somebody that, you know, maybe the mayor or whatever, I mean, that, that's a that's a pretty good reference to have uh and all you, stemming out of that do you mind if i just i want to jump in on that statement alone and I, sure. I i i already find this conversation fascinating we're only like literally five minutes into the conversation so far but did you have someone like that in your childhood did you have someone that you could look up to and say okay i can have a conversation with my local mayor or my local mp or uh, someone in the community that you could sort of bounce ideas off of like the kids are doing with you at these local events you know i that's a really good question um because you must have learned it from somewhere was it your parents? Was it the the desire for them to give back to their community through volunteerism that you led I, down that path? I I think that's the right yeah I think that's the right direction because I think of my dad's out on many many boards he you know all kinds of things and of course I would always get dragged along at, at that time at that age I always thought I'm getting dragged along but uh, I've always I've always liked to sit and watch and observe people and and listen. To what's going on and it's it's probably been the more formative education i've gotten was just sitting there shutting up and, and listening and i would listen to the conversations going on and of course dad was really good he would introduce me to the people in the in the room and all this kind of stuff so i kind of knew a lot of those influential people through my dad and as i you know matured and, and got older and strike strike out in there i could they would always, and it, it didn't matter whether it was the local banker or the guy that ran the co-op store or whatever it might be, they all knew who I was because they all knew my dad. Um, and if I had a, a question to ask or or whatever, they were always very open to, yeah, so it, it set me up with a circle of um, advisors, I guess, through my dad. Um, was was dad in law political? Would, well, my dad actually, uh, once he kind of semi-retired from the farm, he moved into our, our small local town, a town of about 400 people. Um, he decided that the, you know, very community orientated, he'd sat on school boards and hospital boards and all kinds of things. So he decided to run for mayor. And he did, uh, I don't know how many, three or four terms as the mayor uh, as well. And uh, and did that, and it was okay. Kind of funny. I've, I've got to ask what community. I've got to ask that question because <laughs> now this this story is getting a little bit more intriguing for Chris Brown here, Dave. <laughs> but what community are we talking here? Uh, a small town by the name of Mossbank, Saskatchewan. It's uh, south of Moose Jaw, about uh, forty. I know it quite well. <laughs> oh, really? I do. I, I, I deal with a lot of Saskatchewan politicians as well, Dave. So yes, I don't okay. mind. <laughs> well, it's I got to tell you, it's, it's funny, Chris. I was on a phone call with a fellow one day uh, when I was in the RCMP and I was making some inquiries and I was talking to a fellow and I can't remember what the context was, but we got talking and he said, oh yeah, well, he's from Saskatchewan as well. And I said, oh really? And of course he asked the question. He said, so whereabouts, you know, are you, are you from? And I said, oh, just a small town. And he goes, well, what's the name of it? And I go, well, Moss Bank. And he goes, 43 nautical miles south of Moose Jaw. And I go, well, that's pretty specific. And I said, 43 nautical miles south of Moose Jaw. And he said, yeah, I was in the Air Force and I was in the control tower at CFB Moose Jaw. He says, I know exactly where Moss Bank is because Moss Bank was a part of the Commonwealth training program. And the runways are still there. So the snowbirds would go and, and they would fly in the area in case they had the ditch, they had a runway. And so I grew up watching the snowbirds perform, uh, you know, just out in the, you know, 
out doing the summer fall and you'd watch the snowbirds going through their routine right so this country is so vast but so small at the exact same time i have heard that story about moose for the the runways there a few times yeah. But yeah. I want to I want to go back to you for a second because I feel like we could just talk about the similarities between you and your father for a few more hours just in itself. But I want to turn back to you. And now I did a bit of a deep dive. You first were elected to council in 2004 as a counselor. Right. So that is 20 years ago. This year, you were thinking about putting your name on that ballot. What was that decision based on? Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, uh, in, in 2004, I retired from the RCMP. So my last shift was, I think, in about July. And, of course, I don't know why, but when you retire, everybody says, so what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm retired. Who says I have to do anything? Well, you're a young guy. you gotta, you got to do something, right? And they said, there's a municipal election come up. You should run for council. And I go, hadn't really thought about it but I thought you know it it intrigued me a little bit so I thought you know what it would keep me invested in the community uh let me you know still have uh some input into the development of the community and I mean we all pitch in we create the community we want to live in and I thought I've spent a lot of time you know um policing in the community and um had and you I consider it prior to 24, 2004 to run in municipal politics or elected office was never for you, like your father? Not, yeah, not really. I really didn't understand uh, what all was involved. I thought with a gun and a badge, I had pretty good influence in a community, right? But, you know, really, uh, an elected official with the checkbook has a lot more influence in the community. <laughs> oh, I love this conversation, Dave. <laughs> So you, you, you're you a counselor from 2004 to 2013. You have a brief hiatus in 2013 to 2017. Yep. You do not run for any position. You retire as a counselor, I'm assuming. But the itch, the itch of municipal politics comes calling in 2017 for the mayor's chair. Did you want to come back or was this sort of people rallying around saying, Dave, maybe it's time for you to put your name in and be the mayor? What was going, what happened in 20, between 2013 to 2017 to make you want to come back to become part of the community again? I was, I was uh, really busy um, in about 2008. Uh, I was taken on by, uh, it was kind of a, a change. There was, there was a program in the in the province that required some traffic safety coordinators, and it was first uh, a bunch of the uh, provincial uh, ministries threw a bunch of money into this. The collision and fatality rate in the province of Alberta was out of control. We were losing 400 people a year on our Alberta highways, and so they wanted to. They did a commission to. Um, actually a previous uh, key division commanding officer to do up a report on what they felt needed to happen. And so anyway, the ministries couldn't decide who was going to run this. So they contracted out to the University of Alberta, the uh, Alberta Office of uh, Injury Prevention and ACICR was the name of it at that time, right? So we got taken on uh applications came out and this is funny i never read the local newspaper uh, you know for the ads and stuff like that i read the paper but i don't look at the ads and i'm flipping through it one day just out of curiosity and and i flip over and here's this ad looking for traffic safety uh coordinators and i kind of look at this and i go huh and i read the requirements university of, of alberta is hiring and all this stuff and i go yeah, why not? So I submit my resume. About a week later, I get a call saying, yeah, we want to interview you. Uh, a week after that, I do an interview. And the, the about four days later, I get a phone call saying, yeah, we want to offer you the job. Okay. Um, and what it was, was there was about 16 of us sprinkled all through the province. We each had a region. We were to go out into the region work with the communities in the region to sort of deal with their traffic safety issues. And 
it was a very fulfilling job. I absolutely loved it, but it was really involved. Like it was a full-time gig and, and it, and my area went right from Westlock to Grand Cash. So I had a huge area. Wow. Yeah. So, and a real diverse area because I had White Court, I had Jasper, Edson, Hinton, um, you know, um, Westlock, uh, Marathorpe, uh, Swan Hills. Like I had communities that were so diverse in, in the and way And a lot of things. rural communities too, it sounds like it. Like this was like, yeah. this is like for those who were listening outside of Alberta, like what he's talking about is basically a large chunk of Alberta that is very sparse, but very rural as well. When you do get to those larger urban centers, they are there, but it's there and gone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some communities are agriculturally based. Some are uh, oil industry, some are tourists like Jasper, some are, um, yeah, mining, uh, you know, so they all have a different need when it came to traffic safety. And I found it was absolutely fascinating to work with the communities and I had lots of resources to work with. Um, anyway, it was supposed to be a 30 month trial, uh, just to see how it went. Well, the people that they had selected to be traffic safety coordinators, we met the goals in about nine months and what they were expecting to happen in 30 months. They had taken on a fair amount of us ex-coppers. And of course we know how to work in a community. So we just went forward and did our thing and had lots of connections and were able to walk into like we owned the place, right? And got lots of cooperation and we really advanced it. And actually the, and we had tangible results. The death rate in the province of Alberta dropped by 30%. Wow. Uh, just from the awareness programs we were doing. So then Alberta Transportation said, okay, we want to take this program over and continue on with it. So we went from being traffic safety coordinators with the U of A to traffic safety consultants for Alberta Transportation. And they had an Alberta Office of Traffic Safety. Anyway, this is making a really long story. I love uh, it. Because if you, it was a short story, it wouldn't work on a show like this. That's long format. <laughs> so take all the time you want there, Dave. <laughs> so anyway, it got to a point where I was uh, extremely busy. And uh, after three terms on council, um, I was getting a lot of... Um, encouragement to take the mayor's chair and i thought okay but i i just didn't feel i would have the time to do the mayor's chair justice and i found i was getting spread out pretty thin because i had a lot of other things going on in the community aside from all this other stuff and i i find i was starting to burn the candle on both ends and in the middle and uh, said something's got to go off the plate and i thought no i'm going to sit out a term and just see how it all goes and and so I did that and carried on with the traffic safety stuff and, and everything else. And, and, uh, so, yeah. And so you are now in your second term as mayor of the, the great community of the town of Barhead and right. you were elected in 2017, reelected in 2021. Um, and with your three terms as councillor prior to that, I've got to ask a very important question to you about your role on council and the role in council and, and general now, you are one vote, and you are one vote around that table, uh, and you have some very big things that you have to make decisions on on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis, whenever you get those council agendas. How do you know you're doing the good for the community with what the with the vote that you have at that council table? You know, I would draw back, and we're all a product of our experiences. And having served in as an RCMP officer in a bunch of smaller rural communities, it it really gives you insight because you see those communities 24-7. You know the night people, you know the day people, you know everybody. Um, I always say if you're in a community long enough, you've seen everybody in their underwear at one time or another, right? And you get a feel for the community and you build up those, it's all about to be effective in a small community as a police officer, it's about building those relationships, right? You have to have a relationship with, with the, the 
community supporters, the community builders, um, even even the people that are uh, on the wrong side of of the law. You know, it's so. Am I, have am I have you found the balance yet? Because I can imagine, I can only imagine, because I've never been able to sit around a council table. But I can imagine there are decisions that you make that you know are going to upset some people in your community because you know at the end of the day, not 100% of the population is never going to agree on 100% of the things that the city is doing or the town is doing or the community is doing. How do you work in a community? Because you are the closest to the people. You don't go to Edmonton to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You make a decision, whether it be property tax increase, uh, road closure, whatever. You go to the grocery store. You're probably going to hear about it the day after from yeah. people. So how do you work in a small community for the betterment with understanding that you're going to try to have to not anger as many people as you possibly have to? You know, this is where our skill as communicators, I think people are, you know, they may not like what you're saying, but they appreciate the honesty of this is this is the realities of our situation. And as much as we'd like to build a new field house complex. I was going to say, don't... please tell me it's a swimming pool. All I've heard this week from mayors and councillors is every community needs a new swimming pool. Anyway. We've got one. Oh, there so you go. We're, yeah, yeah. No, we're we're uh, we're we're pretty fortunate with uh, uh, being able to have the facilities that we do here. Uh, but you know, it's it's again. I get back to the honesty. As I as I went from doorstep to doorstep during um, election process, right, and it's where you really get a chance to talk to people about things and in, in a you know pretty open and. And I remember this conversation with a lady and she said, and I said, so is there anything that, that we could do to maybe try and improve your life here in the community? And, and she pointed, she says, well, the streets aren't very well lit. Could we have a couple more street lights put in? And so I kind of looked at the street and I said, well, you know, part of the problem is these lights were installed when the streets were put in years and years and years ago. The trees also put in at the same time have matured to the point where they have this huge umbrella and this is what's filtering out some of the light so i said the cost of putting in a light standard is this much which is a lot and i said so we have to dip into some other you know bag of money and take it from there to put street lights in here uh, so i said here's the decision do we want to take it away from the food bank do we want to take it away from you know an infrastructure project do we want to take you know do we want to remove your sidewalk to put a street light in i mean i and i told this lady this i said it's like a household budget you got enough money do you get the new fridge or do you get the new tv you because you can't have both you got to pick which one is more important to you and i said but the cost of putting in a street light is is it's costly right i said but we could have our public works guys come by here and trim the trees back, which would be more affordable. And she goes, Oh no, don't want the trees cut back. <laughs> I go, well, okay. You've made that decision, right? Uh, you like the trees. And, and by the end of the conversation, she goes, yeah, you know, there's enough light um, that, that we can function here and, Okay, I'm gonna cool. I'm gonna pick up on that statement a little bit here, and because I was gonna talk about this later on, but you played in this sandbox, so I'm gonna play in the sandbox with you yeah. a little bit. That issue to that resident, though, is the most important issue to them. That is the issue yeah. that they believe is the most important. Now, if I go talk to 100 people in Barhead, they're gonna have 100 different issues that they Absolutely. believe is the most important issue. But you, as a council, you as mayor, know that there's a limited supply of money. How do you balance the needs of the community against the needs of the individual? Because when they, when people pay property taxes, they want to, they, they're they going to assume, and I know you should never assume, but they're going to assume that they're going to see some benefit to that property tax dedicated towards their issues. Yeah. How do you as mayor and council balance those individual issues and make people feel like they're part of a community and not just paying into a pocket that is fixing a road? Well, blocks away 
yeah again it gets back to that clear communication and and giving the information to the community so they understand what we're dealing with you know when we talk about a, a street improvement uh one block of street is over a million dollars and and it's not getting cheaper <laughs> No, it isn't getting cheaper. And and I've had these conversations with people and they go, well, it's, I mean, the, the Department of Highways, they can put in two miles of highway for that same cost. Yes, but they don't have sewer lines, water lines, communication lines. They don't have curbs and gutters and sidewalks. This is all the cost of that block of, of town street that we're putting in. And they go, oh yeah, I never thought about that because it's a hidden infrastructure. You don't see it. You know it when it's not working, but you don't see it. And um, and sometimes when you remind them that, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff underneath that asphalt that uh, needs to be replaced as well. And that's not cheap stuff, right? So, so, uh, so it's just, I... go ahead. It's to, it's to give them a better understanding of what yeah. all's involved, you know? Um, and people are pretty accommodating, you know, they, again, they may not like what they're hearing, but they understand and appreciate the truth of the issue, right? And I'm cautious of time here. I just realized we're 25 minutes into this conversation. I didn't realize that. That's how, that's how these conversations go with me. I get so engrossed by the conversation that I'm like, oh God, we've been 25 minutes. But I want to ask this question because I think this is the most important that I, question that I want to learn from individual communities. I have said on this show numerous times over and over again that there is a blurring of jurisdictional lines and understanding of what residents understand that the municipality's role in their day-to-day -day lives is. When people do talk to you, are they talking about the municipal issues? Are they talking about that infrastructure, that water, that sewage? Or are they now asking you more about healthcare, education, federal issues? Or do, do people of Barhead understand that the municipality has a, a jurisdictional role to play, the province does, and the federal government does? Oh, very much so. Yeah, uh, the, you're absolutely right. Uh, the general public have a have a blurring of that. They, they don't okay. know where the lines are, right? And, and a lot of times, you're right. I would say probably half the conversations I have in a day are with people that are complaining about the things that the feds are doing or the province is doing. Um, and you I don't say, I, you don't I, say. And, I, and a lot of times, a lot of times people just need to vent out. Uh, again, the experiences I've had in, in the RCMP is, you know, they, they, they know there's no solution to it. They just want to talk about it and, and vent out a little bit. So you, you're the sounding board and, and uh, agree and and if we have input into any of those issues um you know because I, I i have said to them that's no i i appreciate it. i'm a member of this community as well i pay property taxes as well i you know i'm i'm standing right beside you here it's just that i have input into you know some of the directions we go but they do too um, in fact, just this morning, I had a lady come walking in and, and she was talking to the girls at the front desk and I could see her point towards my office. Yeah, come on and sit down and tell me what's on your mind. You'd never get that opportunity with a premier or the, or the prime minister. You know, we are probably the most accessible elected officials that the average person can access. And even in a small community, I try and get an appointment with the mayor of Calgary or Edmonton. Boy, you have to go through a, a gamut to get to talk to them. But in a rural community, we're all in this boat together. And I think they appreciate, you know, people appreciate that. That Yeah, I understand your issues because I got the same concerns. But I know the workings of, of government. And maybe we can take the issue you have with the province add our voice to it and and uh and get because it it's there easier radar. it's easier for you to pick up the phone and contact an mla or a minister than an average resident and i say that to, like kind of as a shot across the bow to our elected officials in ottawa and edmonton because i don't think that should be the case but it is truly a easier access for you to call them than potentially someone on the street yeah. And it's, it's a matter of knowing it's, it's, uh, we know 
who can answer that? We know the ministries. Yeah. We know, you know, I mean, I, because I've been there, you know, you phone, you, you dial up a government office and say, I want to talk about this. Well, you got, you're going to need to call these guys. Right. And you call them and they say, well, we'll put you through to here. And, oh, they're on holidays this week. And, you know, it's just a it's a maze. And I kind of wonder if it isn't engineered that way. Um, <laughs> you're letting you're letting <laughs> Ottawa secrets out there, Dave. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Before. So I want to turn to my next segment because I want to I want to make sure we talk about this because I promised we're, I said we're going to talk about the town of Barhead. We're going to talk about the town of Barhead. But before I do this, I preface this conversation, this part of the conversation with this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. The mayor is one vote and one vote alone on his council. So for those who are about to send emails saying that this is not what Barhead's talking about at council, well, that's because he's the mayor and he this is his opinion. Please send your emails to me, not him. That being said, <laughs> Mayor McKenzie. In your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Barhead today as of recording this episode? I would say, and this is a concern of mine and council, is the consistent downloading of responsibilities from, we don't see it so much from the federal government, but definitely from the provincial government. You know, we're trying to keep these communities running and provide the infrastructure and the services and the recreational opportunities for a community. Meanwhile, uh, the province continues to download responsibilities for um, all kinds of things. Uh, they don't increase the funding available for certain organizations like FCSS and uh, victim services units and I mean the list goes on are you and, happy with your allotment for LGFF well we're never <laughs> happy right? I'm poking the I'm poking the proverbial mayor or bear here aren't I yeah yeah you know it's uh we can always do more uh and and I think I think municipalities most well I know the the town of Barhead we have an amazing staff here. Our administration is amazing and they can, they can take a dollar bill and make it stretch to make it, a, you know, $5. Um, and our staff are really good are, you know, with all kinds of, of things to make things happen. And we're very, we're very conscious of the public dollar. Uh, so we're not, we're not, uh, we're not, we're not spending like drunken sailors on a weekend pass We're, you know, cause it's my, it's my tax dollars as well. I think one of the things that, that really sets us apart from the provincial and federal government is a municipality only has one source of income and that's property tax. We don't get, we don't get incomes from other things like the province does and the feds do. So, and That's on the flip side, sole... you have to you have to balance your budget every year. You can't run deficits like they can either. That's exactly right. So you know our our uh, our balance sheet is much different than a household uh, balance, uh, you know, checkbook. Um, that's right. So we have to be very conscious. We don't have we don't have our auditor come in and go, "Yeah, you seem to be missing thirty million dollars here." Oh well, you know we. We have to account for every penny um, and we get audited for that. And, and yeah, sometimes, sometimes the public come in and, and they're a little blurred with that. Well, the, the province just can't account for, you know, X millions of dollars and the feds, they, they lose billions of dollars and can't account for it. And, oh, well, <laughs> we're not in that situation. We're, we're not. And justifiably so. We should account for every nickel and what we're spending it on and, and uh, and that's where our financial decisions are made by council, not by me. It's made by council. There's seven seven votes that have to accommodate that. And I'd I'd speak for our council. We have a very good council. We have a very diverse council. Um, so we get opinions on on many different levels, uh, and we make it work. Um, you know, we don't always agree walking in, but once we have that conversation, yeah. a lot of our votes are unanimous. <laughs> 
So, yeah, nobody um, walks in with it. We don't have anybody on our council that has a hidden agenda. They're not so boxed into their their thoughts that they aren't able to see somebody else's point and and maybe do change their opinion on something. So, is it easy to do that? Because you're right. Everyone, okay. <laughs> Dave, I hopefully you have an extra 10 minutes for this conversation because yeah. this is just a fantastic. So there's two things I want to follow up on. I want to go back to provincial downloading, but I want to talk about what you just mentioned there. You're right. The, I would say I would say 98% of municipal councils, municipal councillors, mayors, reeves, directors, whatever they are locally, do not have hidden agendas. But what I will challenge you on, though, is they have unconscious biases. You have a bias against something that you go in. How important is it for you as a mayor, as a counselor, to go into every meeting with an open mind and say, you know what, I may have an idea of how I'm going to vote, but I'm not going to decide fully until I hear all the facts, whether that be from administration, whether it be that from delegations, whether that be even from my fellow counselors, because they may sway my mind and may think, I didn't think of it that way. Now that I have, I can see your side, so I'm going to change my vote. I spent 26 years in the RCMP as an investigator. If you walked into an investigation with a preconceived idea of of what you were looking at, you would be you would be chasing geese all over the place. So you I learned very quickly in my in my policing career that you better stay unbiased. You better stay. Um, Is it hard? Uh, you know what? You I had a couple of occasions where I thought I've got this. I, I know what's happened here. And then as you get more into especially as as the forensics improved, uh, you soon discover that geez, all these circumstances led up to me pointing my finger at this guy. And then when you dig down deeper, no, it wasn't them. And so you go searching off for somebody else. And sure enough, it was this other one that was responsible for it. You know, where you walk in and you, you know, um, you walk into a situation and you have a fast read on something. You go, okay, this looks like this is what's happening. But then once you start talking to everybody, you go, oh yeah, okay, no, this is the this is backwards around the other way, uh, kind of thing. And if you're paying attention to life, you soon realize that until you have most of the information, you really don't know what's going on. And if you have those preconceived ideas going in, then your mind's already closed. You need to keep it open because you're right. Uh, somebody might say something and you go, yeah, I hadn't thought about that because I don't come from that background, but they do. So they see it from that background. One of our counselors is actually uh, physically handicapped. So when we talk about um, construction projects or buildings or improvements, He's the first one to say, <clears throat> you have to design it to accommodate for this. And a lot of times you go, yeah, you know what? Never really thought about that part of our society, right? So he adds a lot to the conversation when we talk about stuff like that. And so do other people, you know, well, I, you know, I grew up with this and I grew up with that. And this is what's happened here. And this is the communities I've been in. And here's what was going on there. And, I mean, collectively, we've got we've got a really good diverse council, and I think they all show up in a meeting with the idea of let's let's have a conversation about this and hear what everybody has to say. And we may not always agree with each other, but we certainly have the respect for each other to know that, you know, uh, nobody nobody gets um, criticized for their comments um because that's that's counterproductive to having a good conversation and as a species on this earth <laughs> we have the best ability to communicate with each other but we really suck at it and what yeah. what social media is not a place where you should go and communicate <clears throat> with people come on mayor what are you talking about you know i watch some of this stuff on social media and and, and i and sometimes i know these people and i go i thought they were fairly well educated 
you know, and then I see what they post and I go, what? <laughs> Everyone from Barhead who's listening to this right now is going through their old social media posts and said, what did I say? Did, is Dave talking about me right now? I, I hope they do, you know, because I, I, I've had people phone up here and they say, oh, I heard that the town's doing this. And I go, does that make any sense to you at all to do something like that? Well, no, not really. So why are you even here asking that question? You know, we don't sit around as council and throw darts at the wall to figure out what we're going to do or how we're going to make a decision here. We don't spin a big wheel, yay or nay. Um, I don't have a big rubber stamp that says canceled or, or rejected. Uh, we listen to everything. And if it makes sense. Can we get we you proceed? a big stamp that says reject it? I just want to see you with a big giant stamp that says reject it. <laughs> just because you've put that in my head. Now I want to see it. I want to well, go back. Every, to per- go ahead. Every time we go into our budget meetings, I always sit there and that's how I open a meeting. It says, okay, dream crushers. Let's get the work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, it, the good segue there for that little joke that you just made. Yes, it was a joke for those who are listening. He does not cross <laughs> dreams for those who are about to tune in. I want to ask, you talked about provincial downloading as being one of the biggest issues that you face. But the reality is, if you don't pay for it, if the province gives it to you and says you have to look after it or they're not going to give you as much money as they want, you need – you have to find savings. You have to find that revenue to pay for that operational cost, whether it be houselessness, homelessness, addictions, mental health, FCSS, uh, victim services, you name it. The municipality has to pick up that cost. The average resident doesn't care, though. The average resident wants to, the, the town, the municipality to do what it needs to do for the community to survive. You have just, I'm assuming, because I've been, I shouldn't assume, I'm, I'm, I know for a fact you have gone through your budget cycle because I've been watching the uh, town newspaper reports out of Barhead. Mm-hmm. You have now had a provincial budget that has been passed. You are now going to be about to send out property taxes, which is, as you've said, the only source of revenue that the municipality has. Mm-hmm. Was this a tough year for the municipality for budget season when the realities are economic, the financial forecast of this country is horrible. People are struggling. The municipality has services that they have to deliver to the people who are struggling. The municipality has services that they have to deliver to support the growth of the community. But you also have to ensure that you don't do it on the backs of your community. Was it a hard budget cycle for you? Oh, well, you look at, we all have, we all have wants, but sometimes you have to only deal with the, with the needs, you know, we, we need to have sewers, we need to have infrastructure, we need to, you know, your road's going to be a little bit bumpy for the next two years, you know, we used to be able to do a major um, street construction or rehab every year. And now it's basically every third year. So, um, you know, we ask for the tolerance of our residents to, you know, yeah, your your street is in bad shape, but we just don't, we can't make it a priority. And we do have priorities. We have 10-year plans for these things and replacement. The minute we put a sidewalk in, the timer starts. Uh, whether there's a resident built right there or not, the timer starts and the wear and tear on that sidewalk begins, whether there's somebody that we're collecting property tax from there or not. So we have to be very frugal. We have to be very strategic in our, in our forward planning. I think we've got an amazing uh, administrative staff here that, that uh, really know this community inside and out. And they know where the priorities uh, for repair and replacement are. Uh, they pitch their case to us. We we make our decisions based on the subject matter experts, uh, not our own opinion. Yeah, my street's rough and tough and all the rest of the stuff, but you'll learn to live with that, you know, uh, because I know that there's other priorities. And I find that the community is really fairly accepting again it's the same sort of thing they may not like what you're saying but they understand it um you know that 
we're all faced in the same thing. And if you draw that correlation between a, a town budget and expenditures with a household budget and expenditures, people get that, you know, um, and, and yeah, it makes for some tough decisions. Uh, but we've, you know, we've gone through probably four years now with minimal property tax increase. Uh, this is actually the first year, I think, in three or four years that we've actually had to increase our property tax and, and minimum. When I, when I look at the cities and some of our surrounding communities that are 5.5%, 7%, 9% increase in property taxes, and we're kind of looking at around 2%. I think we're doing a pretty good job and we're being very sensitive to the economic plight that we're all kind of in right now. So, uh, and I think the public sees that, but it's clear communication. It's, yeah. it's, listen, we're working hard for, for all of you and me, because I'm a taxpayer and a resident here too. The first year I ran, <coughs> excuse me, for council, I just retired from the RCMP. And I get up and there was a, you know, a forum and all this stuff. And I think there was, I think there was 11 people running for council positions, right? So I got up and this really took me off guard. I got up and I said, you know, when the RCMP, when you retire from the RCMP, they will at their cost, send you anywhere you want to go. You can pick any place in Canada and they will pay for your expenses, your move, everything. And I said, I'm staying here. Because I like this community. It seems like you have a passion for it. The place grows on you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've worked in some really active places. <laughs> and uh, when I arrived in Barhead and patrolled around in Barhead for the first few weeks, the word Mayberry popped up in my mind. Yeah. Oh, I feel old now that I get that reference. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and it catches up on you. I uh, I teach judo, and I have a, a judo class, and I had a bunch of kids that were, I was you know running through an exercise program, and I said, uh, I said, okay, I, you know, they're saying which I want them to cut, you know, run some laps. And I said, and they, so they say, which way should I go? And I said, we'll go clockwise. What's that mean? I said, well, you know, clockwise, like a clock, not realizing they're, all, they're, you know, they're all digital, right? Not analog. But I didn't pick up on that right away. And I said, what, are you guys all been living on Gilligan's Island? Who's Gilligan? <laughs> oh, I weep for our next generation of. I know. Well, the upside uh, for me is I can tell old jokes and they've never heard them before. So. <laughs> um, I have one question before I turn to the topic of tourism. And I it's it's something that I've wanted to ask you this entire interview, but I think it's an important question because you have been in the line of duty as an RCMP officer for our country. And I respect you no bombs about that that is a service that you have given to our our country to our communities and i su salute you in any way that i can you've also served on council and while the jobs are different they are totally different one you are potentially getting fired at the other you're getting fired at by social media posts or this that or the other <clears throat> what's been more rewarding for you oh I would say, and and this is going to sound like a cop out, but it it's I would say they were both rewarding in their own ways. You know, when you walk into a scene as a police officer and you can walk out of that scene making somebody's life a little better than it was. And on council, you can make decisions and make life a little better for an entire community. You know, so one's a little more personal, I'd say, or a little bit more day-to-day um, -day life. And the other one is, you know, a, a community advances. And it's not only for the betterment 
and is going to lead into the tourism thing. It's not only for the benefit of the individuals that live in your community, <clears throat> but you, you put effort into creating a community that people want to come and visit. Um, and you know, which is a perfect segue, if you ask me, <laughs> about people coming yeah. to visit. Now, I've promised on this show, and I'm trying to make good on that promise in 2024, that if you come on my show, I will come to your community, I will spend my economic dollars in your community, and I will tour some of these great tourism spots and hopefully sit down with a for over a coffee at one of your coffee shops or local bakeries or local restaurants, and hopefully the mayor will indulge me when I come up to Barhead later on this month, or next month, I should say. But I've got to ask. As the mayor of your community, what are some of the hidden tourism spots that you recommend to anyone coming to your community, whether it be here in Alberta or across Canada or even, yes, because we do have listeners across the world, around the world? You know, every every community can boast that they've got a museum, they got parks, they got picnic areas, they got walkways, they've got... Um, you know, they, they all, all communities have these amenities. And because I've traveled around and worked in, in different communities uh, in my policing career, you get to see what a community has to offer. If there's anything I would say that's a real standout, and this is going to sound a little cheesy, it's the people. Um, we have a main street you can walk into any of the shops on our main street and you will immediately get that hometown vibe. I've talked to a number of people since I've taken this position that have just moved into town or into the, the region, right? And if they come into the front counter and they, yeah, we just moved here. If I overhear that, or sometimes they come in and go, yeah, we're just doing the community. We'd like to meet the mayor. Well, come on in and sit down. And I've and I've talked to, and it's not one offs. It's it's almost a general theme. They come in and and I I remember one lady that came in and she's got three young daughters and it was just on the just on the tail end of COVID. We we're just getting over that, and they were living in a large metro and they wanted a better place to live. So they've been touring around in Alberta just looking for a community to live in. Her husband works, you know, he could work, you know, remotely and all that kind of stuff. So it didn't really matter where they live. And so they drove through Barhead and they had to stop uh, on our main street for some reason or another. And went into one of the stores. And this lady, this mom said, I could not believe how the clerk treated my girls. Made a big fuss over them. And of course, the girls being devoid of, of, you know, that human interaction because of COVID just lapped it up. And that mom said, this is where we want to live. Proceeded to buy property, lived here, you know, Kids are in school, loving the life, right? Prior um, to this, prior to this interview, I was on the Barhead website because they traditionally do a sort of a description of what the community is in the introduction of the show. And there was something, there was this phrase on the Barhead website that stuck out to me, and just you saying those words really brought it home for me. Barhead is a small town with a big heart, and. I can only say this only knowing you've now for about little under an hour here, Dave, but you are that heart, aren't you? You're the one who has been a champion for the community for the last six years. You have helped the community grow. You have helped the community thrive. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard this. You probably have, but thank you so much for doing what you do because it seems like you are the true barhead cheerleader as the mayor only can be so i just wanted to put that on the record there there's my little well i appreciate that before i let you go i have one last question 
We started this interview talking about yourself and your duty to serve. We're ending by talking about the community as a whole. And I've got to ask the million dollar question that I've asked every single municipal leader. And I know they know how to answer it. And I think you've just answered it, but I want you to go a little bit further into it if possible. What makes the town of Barhead such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think Barhead is is ingrained in that sense of community. Um, you know, as as I complain about the province downloading more and more responsibilities and less and less money to make it happen, um, the community is always there um, to pitch in. Um, you know, our FCSS does a fundraiser. And they walk away with everything they need. Um, last summer, we were the, the staging point for an evacuation for one of our other communities. And I'll remember this, that it went out. We have, we have a number of, of social media platforms where we can reach out to the community, right? And we reached out and said, we need... Um, I think it was paper products, clinics and toilet paper, stuff like that uh, for the evacuees. And that went out about nine o'clock in the morning by 1130 or so. Another one went out. Whoa, we got all we need. <laughs> and I laugh because I happened to be down there, you know, dropping some stuff off. And, uh, and I saw that and I, you know, people pulling up with, uh, you know, I don't know if they'd ran in the Costco and got the big bales of toilet paper or what, but I mean, the stuff that was going into that building from the community. So, you know, in our, and everybody's, everybody's budgets are tight, but when it comes to, uh, you know, helping out in that sense of community, um, I, I don't think I've seen a community quite like Barhead respond like Barhead does. Dave, I want to take a moment and say thank you again. Thank you for serving your community and thank you for sitting down with me. This has been a wonderful experience for me to sit down with someone like you who has the passion for their community, who has the desire to serve their community and who continues to get up every morning and serve their community with honor and grace. So thank you so much for doing this. And thank you so much for being part of the municipal world that we call local government. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it, Chris, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my community. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well engaged as well as informed on the issues across Canada. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few years. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Music